Yo, yo, yo. Welcome back to this week's episode of the Championship Corner. I've got, I would say, a friend. I got Andre Smith on here, uh, former O lineman at Bama, played in the league for, gosh, I don't know. How many years did you play in the league? A while, a long time. Uh, yeah, long time. More than a decade. More than a decade. Yeah, we'll roll with that. So, more than a decade as a professional athlete. So, man, welcome, and as always, you know, I want to kick it off, and I want you to share, uh, introduce yourself, and then just kind of share a, a wild, funny story. It could be a locker room story. It could be something crazy a peewee coach has told you, maybe a wild story in the league, but what you got for us, man? Oh, man, wild story. Oh, man. Whew. Put me on the spot. Uh, Probably too many, let me, actually. Uh, let me think. Let me think. Uh, Well, it was this one time we were working out, right? And uh, in college at Bama, this one, uh, Coach Saban first got there. This was, I think it was 07. And, um, we were doing an off season program leading to the training camp. And um, it was myself, uh, another um, defense alignment named um, Josh Chapman. He and I were like in the, we were in the big guy group, so to speak. And then there was another guy who I, I care not to mention his name. So, <laughs> we were uh, uh, we were doing some extra conditioning. It was like six a.m. run, so it's basically just us three out there, and um, we're grinding, we're pushing each other, we're getting better. And uh, um, one of the players, not Josh, the unnamed player, time he was like, "Uh, now nah, we gotta keep running, man. We gotta get you to make sure you all ready to go for the season." He's like, "No, nah, I'm a slamming her goes and." I'm like, nah, man, he's just trying to rest. You, you do this all the time. So um, so long story short, we kept on running. <laughs> Next thing I know, I see a brown stain on my man's <laughs> pants. That's what we're ready to watch this. <laughs> and then I got a little stench. I was like, man, no, you didn't just do that, bro. Me and Josh talking to each other like, man, you tripping, dog. What you got going on? <laughs> he's like, bro, I told y'all I had to go. So that's when the first time that I saw Coach um a coach actually run the crap out of that guy. So oh, <laughs> literally. like literally, literally, that's his <laughs> that's his stare. Was that when you first got there? Or was that later on? No, that's when um Coach Saban first got there. You know, I got down there um summer of '06. Um, uh, he didn't come to the spring of '07. So yeah, yeah, yeah. so that's been a year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. hilarious. Man, what? <laughs> So what's it feel like now uh, not playing? Is like how, like waking up in the morning, like is, is there a big difference? Is it weird? Um, obviously, I want you to get in because I know you just kind of started coaching. So I want you to talk about that a little bit too, if you want to. Um, but yeah, waking up, not having to think about summer workouts, not having to, well, I guess now it's like preseason for all those guys in the league and like getting ready to like really hit the ground run. And what's that been like for you, kind of that transition? Uh, the transition transitions have been really well. Um, my wife and I, uh, we had a plan coming into um coming into retirement, so everything's been going really well. Like you just said, I got into coaching, we're doing the whole line training aspect of um just you know giving those guys the opportunity to work with someone who's actually done it, been successful at high level at all levels, been successful, and just um giving those guys those gems, you know, just certain tendencies, knowing what. It, you know, that's one thing that Chad Slade and I teach big man just knowing what to anticipate because, you know, if you go to the game, go to the line with a game plan, you're executed nine times out of ten because linemen most of the time are like one of the smartest group of guys in football because, you know, we only could be successful if five of us are hitting at the same time. Yeah. If five of us hitting like piano keys, then the play's not going to work. So that's just been um, real cool about being getting to the line coaching. Yeah, yeah. How'd you guys team up, you and Chad? Uh, actually, um, Chad's Chad Slade and I, we worked out together in Birmingham, a gym called Godspeed um, here. And we worked out together, I'd say about six years, six to seven years. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we just always had a great rapport. And um, he actually started a um, lineman training camp probably like three weeks before I did. So it just like how it all just coincided and worked well together. And uh, we just like, hey, uh, he wanted to do online training. I want to do online training. So we just decided to join forces and um, it's been great. It's been very um um been it's been very um 
giving to um, give be able to give those kids just very good to the heart, you know, just to get those kids the opportunity, you know, just to know those things that we didn't have opportunity to get or get those uh, just those coaching ideas. Yeah, I'm curious too because obviously, like following you in on social and stuff like that. Uh, Big Man Factory, by the way, I love the name and the logo is dope as shit. Not gonna lie. Um, I I don't know you, you don't know if you created that. You got the creative gene or what? But it is pretty badass. <laughs> Um, what's kind of like your vision with that? Obviously, because you just kind of started that over the last, I don't know, handful of months or so. Um, like, where do you want to see, like, what's the vision now? And like, what would kind of like the ultimate dream vision of that look like? You know what? Uh, I'm just taking the day at a time, you know, whatever guy leads me to, you know, which way to go. But, you know, I'm just, you know, grinding. Hopefully, you know, we end up in the build. I want to get a building, um, like storefront and, uh, have what people actually come in and get work, you know, with the proper equipment. And, but, you know, we're just going to take it a day at a time. Everything's been going really well. Uh, like, I live in Alabama, fortunately, so weather's not really a bad thing. Right. We might deal with rain from time. But other than that, you know, it's always going to be sunny, hot, and dry for the most part. But, uh, but like I said, I'm just taking it a day at a time. I'm um, just grinding with our clientele, grind, growing, growing um, every day. So uh, it's been going really well. Yeah, 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 yeah. So how's it, uh, how did you, I don't know if you got lured in, sucked into like the coaching, the, the, the high school coaching world, um, uh, how, how, how'd that all transpire? Oh man, you know, uh, like I said, Chaz and I have been working together and, um, he actually was already coaching at Moody the season prior to, so he coached there the season last year in 22 and, um. He had a little bit of experience, you know, working with the O line. And um, like I said, we joined forces and then we decided he asked me, uh he and Jake talked about me joining the staff and uh, and I just thought about like the opportunity that presented itself. I mean, besides the personal training stuff I had going on, I said, why not? And um, uh, you know, it's been great. It's been uh it's been very fun, uh, a lot of joy, a lot of great days, you know, it's always grand days for office line, but just to see the guys get better and better every day and um, just to see how hard they work and how they want to be successful. Because as a player, you never – it's like like you don't want to be good at what you do. Right. It's not like you're, like, trying to go out there and intentionally mess up. But uh, just to see those guys, like, really work hard and take – really buy in to what Chad's, Chad and I are saying, it's, it's been really great. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, too. Uh, I was talking with uh, a group of college coaches, yes, yes, the day before yesterday, and – like how powerful it is to have somebody you look up to believe in you, right? Like the idea is, is a lot of these kids probably like look up to you and Chad, like in terms of, of like, whether it's personally, and then obviously like from an athletic realm too. And I know you mentioned it before is like being able to give them these little gems here and there, but I feel like a lot of the superpower probably comes from just talking with them as people, right? Like, like, Hey, like you may not have it now. Like that's, a, that's okay. And to get that sense of, of like belief from somebody else has got to be like super empowering. Yeah. You know, I mean, me for, if I, if I had somebody, you know, that played in the league and was really successful in college and high school telling me that, Hey, if you just do this <laughs> and do this, like I would be like, head so over here for, but, you know, just to see those guys light up when, um, when we pour into those guys, those, uh, the hard work and that, you know, off the line, you know, I figure, I believe it's the hardest sport in football. We never take a snap off. We never come off the field. And then, like I said, defensive line, they may play 50 snaps in the game, but if there's 75 snaps in the game, who's playing the other 25? Right, <laughs> so, right. So just, you know, go against those guys, you know, just to compete at a high level and just for those guys to believe in everything that we say has been really great. Like we have a great group of young men. I mean, they work extremely hard. Yeah. Yeah. Did you kind of come in with a, I don't know if system is the right word, but like something like, okay, like, Hey, here's where we're going to start like a process, I guess, or, or a framework in terms of like, Hey, like this is where we are. This is kind of where I see you. Like, let's be patient. We're going to like, this is the end point. We're going to get there, but like, it's not going to be tomorrow. Is that kind of how you've approached it with them? Uh, you know, um, fortunate enough, Coach Slade, he did a really good job in preparing the guys. So they were, like, pretty advanced as far as, like, knowing the terminology that I was speaking when I came in, uh, the technique, the way that it needed to be done. Like, I'm telling you, these guys over there, like, they're, like, really, really, like, some really hardworking young men. And 
Um, they might not, all of them may not have the athletic ability, but the, their effort, you know, you can't teach them effort. Effort comes from within. So just the drive and just the way they work has been really impressive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm interested to, like, as you work to, I like to use the word, like, transform them, transform them as people and transform them as athletes and really, like, guide them down the path, like, where they want to go in terms of, like, the, their athletic dreams is – what was, I guess this is kind of a twofold question is like, what was, cause like you said, like you kind of had to like experience it and learn it on your own. You didn't necessarily have like that tour guide going from high school to college and then college from the pro level. So like, what are some of the things that like, once you stepped on campus to college, like that you had to start to transform yourself to be as successful as you were. And then vice, and then also like going from college to pro, cause that's a whole different level as well. Like what are some of the things that you had to step into and like really transform yourself as a person so that you can play like over a decade and kind of like break the, the, the percentage in terms of, of like how, how long so many, or how many, how long so many professional athletes play? What was some of that transformation like for you? Oh man, you know, um, really just learning really to take care of your body. Um, that was one thing that I learned when I got to NFL. I really didn't know much about about it when I got to the league, but I really didn't learn. I mean, I had guys tell me to get massages and things like that, but man, I don't feel bad. I feel good. Like my first <laughs> two, three years, like I feel amazing, bro. Like I don't need all this. Like y'all tripping. Like, and then, um, uh, fortunate enough, I got another team with the guy James Harrison. You know, everybody thinks James just is like crazy big asshole of a guy, but uh, he's a phenomenal teammate. Um, he actually got me into acupuncture and like deep tissue massages and whatnot. And uh, um, I can see the change in my game <laughs> when I actually started doing it, when it came to game day and the recovery time, you know, and, um, you know, because in football, it's like every play is like a car crash, a mini car crash. Right, right, right. In the trenches, I mean, you're banging every play. There's hardly any plays that you get to take play off where you don't hit someone. So, I mean, just like for him to come in and teach us those things, I mean, I just – to get it from him, like I said, like those guys telling me how to take care of their body, like me telling those guys how to become great off his linemen, he taught me how to take care of my body the proper way to be a better NFL football player. So that was one thing that I learned from him and him being as successful as he was in the NFL. Why not listen to James Harrison? Totally. He's already a freak of a human being for the way that he looks, the way he walks around. And um, just to have that insider knowledge on how to take care of your body just a little bit better than that was like amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what about what? Like flip the switch, and then I think that's what helped for long. Do you feel like a lot of guys? What do you say? Or do you feel like a lot of guys like miss the boat on that in terms of of like why some make it over a decade and some make it four or five years? Like, do you feel like that's like a big factor in terms of like, like you said, you come in, you're 22, 23 years old, you're like, shit, I feel good. Like, I don't, <laughs> I don't need to do all that, and then. <laughs> after a thousand car crashes, like you said, it's like, it's all like, it can almost be too late at that point um, for a lot of people just because they don't realize like the wear and tear that it's actually done on their bodies. Um, you know, it's just like, man, like, you know, the game's violent, you know, it is what it is. Like I enjoy playing a game of football. That's why like, this time away, like I can't see myself taking on a bull rush right now. <laughs> like I don't want <laughs> yeah. any part of a bull rush right now. And I don't want to like run block anybody. I don't want to do any of that. Like I want those guys to be successful. You know, those guys that are doing it right now, they keep grinding. They're doing a great job. Uh, the game is evolving and it's getting faster and faster and better yeah. and better every year. And um, you know, the games is just great. And um what was the question you asked me one more time? Like, in terms of, do you feel like that's why a lot of guys, once they make the league, is they miss the boat on, like, how how well to actually take care of their bodies? Because when they're coming in, like you said, at first, like, you were like, bro, I'm 22. Like, I feel fine. Like, it's, it's not that big of a deal. And then all of a sudden, you wake up one morning, and you're like, what the fuck just happened to my body? Like, right. <laughs> right. Do you but feel like then, that's like that big missing gap for a lot of the young guys? Right. Then it's also like a lot of guys that like get drafted high, you know, they have a lot of success early in their career and 
They may not even want to play for a second deal. They get all the money they want. They rookie deal might not even want to play anymore. Then there's guys who, unfortunately, you know, everybody get hurt at some point in time playing football. You know, that's a part of the game. And then it's also just like the learning aspect of football, knowing the X's and O's in and out. You know, you have to be consistent in the NFL in order to stay. Like right? it's hard to make it in the NFL because you know new talent comes in every single year. Somebody just fine for a job or someone that's looking or a new rookie that's got a, um, the big deal they just signed who's the first round pick like who's going to get play time just because he's a first round pick like you have different situations like that and you just have to prepare every year as if you were the same rookie coming in and a lot of guys don't know how to do that they get comfortable and you know with what they have whatever they have going on some guys may be thriving off the field and may like Thing like this rookie deal may be the only deal they get, you know. But yeah, it's just, just you know, it's just all about that person and their personality where they come from and um, their desire to be successful. But you know, I was fortunate enough to go to Alabama where Coach Saban uh, implemented early that uh, ones versus ones always going to be the thing that we're going to do. So it's going to be one defense versus one offense all the time. And competition brings the best out of a man. So I learned that early on, like. Coach Saban's going to bring the best of the best in, and y'all going to compete against each other. And then we all go out there on Saturday, the game's going to seem easy. And that's exactly what happened in year two with Coach Saban. And, um, like I said, he laid the foundation, and we're still standing on that foundation right now. I mean, like, he's done a phenomenal job down there. There's no um, question about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What was the biggest, like – I was happy to be a part of that. Yeah, 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 yeah. What was the biggest, like, as you the came in, like, what was the biggest as the you came in? I know. All right. Got me? Yeah, I got you. Okay. What was the biggest, what was that big transition, like, from high school to college? And I guess it's almost two because you kind of went through a coaching change, and that's different. Like, no matter who it is, no matter what it is, like, there's there's just differences <laughs> in that and learning to adapt to that. So what was some of those, I guess, like, learning moments and how you had to adapt, like, as a person and as, and, and as a player? Well, uh, basically, they, they don't have to be nice to you anymore. <laughs> when you get <laughs> uh, the Mr. Nice Guy role, role goes out the window. As soon as you commit, sign that letter of intention, and you're down there day one, all uh, that goes out the window. But uh, They were so nice like on my a, recruiting my, trip, though. <laughs> yeah, I had Rocky Colburn, who was the strength coach at, from uh, Atlanta Falcons at the time, and um, – he was my strength coach with Coach Shula my freshman year. And uh, I actually got a high ankle sprain while uh, doing the walkbacks. You know, that's when you run like 40 yards, but you got to walk back and you got to be back for, so, for a certain time. By the time the whistle blows, it's time to take off again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I basically, I rolled my ankle doing that, some type of freak away. I rolled my ankle. So I got injured like early summer going into my freshman year. So it was like a point, like I didn't know whether I was going to play or not. And then just having to like, Go to rehab. Like, I had never got injured in high school. Like, I didn't know about going to rehab and everything, just figuring out, like, doing the rehab and having to go to class and waking up early in the morning, make sure I'm on time for rehab and learning how to operate with crutches and whatnot. So, like, just to go through that, that was one hard transition that I had to figure out. Like, I had never been injured. Like, I didn't know what to do. Like, I'm freaking out. Like, I'm, at, like, I'm about to be on the bench. I'm about, like, I'm about to have a red shirt here because I'm like, man, I want this three-year plan. Like, I want to be here for three years and I'm out. Like, I don't want to, like, like, I want to be three years and done. So, like, I had that going on. But fortunate enough, my ankle healed up well. And uh, I was able to start training camp on time. And the rest is history. That, so, the, that was one transition. And then, um, Probably the, the biggest one of the biggest transitions with Coach Saban from Coach Shula was uh he was um the food man Coach Saban was so strict on the food bro oh my god <laughs> bro, Coach Saban had me Terrence Cody uh who else Josh Chapman uh, who else uh, Alex Stadler uh, it's about it was probably about six, maybe six or seven of us. Man, we were eating like birds, seemingly. <laughs> <laughs> when Coach Saban got down there, man, like breakfast, we would eat. And breakfast was like uh, an already cooked egg waffle, 
cut up into like a half on the side <laughs> table. Then we had some like some eggs. Then we had like a piece of bacon. And maybe so were like y'all's a, plates already made? Like, was it like, yes, or was it like, they were oh, already oh. pre-made. Yes, yes. <laughs> no yes. buffet style anymore. No buffet. No buffet. Oh, and a piece of steak. A piece of steak. So I'm going, my rookie year, that's what I look mean for pre-game. <laughs> like every, every, every pre-game, I'll be waffle, eggs, steak, every pre-game. And that's all I know. That's what I learned from Go Save, and that's all yeah. I did. And then later on in my career, I'm like, man, they're like, dude, why you eat the same thing? I'm like, man, that's why I know if I'm gonna say. I'm like, man, bro, you can't eat like that before the game, bro. You gotta get you some of these hash browns. <laughs> you gotta get you some of this other stuff, some omelet, maybe. <laughs> like, you got all this stuff. But like, nah, but uh, that's like one of the biggest changes was post post saving. What's the food, man? Oh my god, it was like a shell shop, bro. Shell yeah, shop. yeah, yeah. What did y'all? What did y'all eat with Coach Shula? Yeah. Man, listen here. Like Friday nights before the game, people would not eat all freaking day, bro. Like waiting on this pregame meal, like night before the game. Like we would have like fried chicken, macaroni, uh, green beans, mashed potatoes, uh, bro, dinner rolls. Uh, we would have like uh, ice cream or cookies for dessert. Like this would be like every home game. Like every Friday night, we like even away games. We eat like this. Like when we went down to bed, play down to Baton Rouge, my rookie year, my freshman year. It was by far one of the best pregame meals I ever had. <laughs> I don't know what the hotel had going down in Baton Rouge, playing at LSU. They had that Crystal's hot sauce on the table, man. <laughs> it was so good. It was so good. <laughs> so, I guess too is um since we're kind of like talking about college days is like, like you said, like coach Saban, like really laid like the foundation of like, even like where they are today in terms of literally always competing kind of national championship or bust. It was, it, you know, it's kind of like literally being the best of the best or the bus or bust. What do you feel like from teams that you played on that reached that pinnacle that won national titles versus teams that weren't as successful. What were some of like the differences? Um, and you could even compare from like college to pro too, if there was a successful season to college versus an unsuccessful season in pro, like what are some of the differences in terms of that? Uh, you know, uh, I would say the transition was probably from the, um, uh, 07 to 08 season. Um, Coach Saban, he like, he really like that 07, 06, 07 all season program, like Matt Drills, they were called, we call it the fourth quarter program down in Bama. Man, it was so freaking long. Like, it was like eight weeks, it felt like. Like, Ryan, it was so long, bro. We started re giving gifts that we gave out at the beginning. <laughs> like, that's how long it was. Like, Coach Saban worked the crap out of us that 07 season. Going, but, we, I mean, we didn't play that well. Um, we played okay. We made it to a ball game. We yeah. lost in the ball game. But uh, the next year's been when you've seen the really a big jump from the pro, in the program. You know, we won, like, 12 games that year, and I think we lost two that year. And you just saw, like, the like everybody just really bought into it, whatever – um, Coach Saban was saying at the time of preaching to us about yeah. and how to do, like, each play only lasts for six to five, but maybe anywhere from five to seven and a half seconds. This is the length of a play on any level, like in high school, college, or NFL. So if you can give me your hardest effort for five to seven seconds, then and get that 40 second time to relax and rest and get a reset during that 40 second break you know, in between each play. Like, then you're going to be successful. So that 08 season, that was all the O-line was thinking, like, hey, bro, we go hard for five to six seconds, bro. We're going to have success. And long story short, like, we went out there and kicked butt every Saturday. Like, that O-line, they gave me, Marlon, Drew Davis, um, um, Justin Bree, Antoine Carwell. Man, we were winning jokers out there. Even I watched the uh, this uh, recent um, show about uh, Florida Gators. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, that Swamp King they show. had a few highlights on the game that we played them in the SEC Championship. I saw myself on there. And I'm like, man, them dudes weren't even that good. <laughs> like, like they, were, they were good, but they weren't like that. Right, right. I mean, like, we had, we had closed the gap on them. Like, my freshman year, they were way better than us. 
not want to even say way better than us. They beat us by like by like I want to say by team maybe seven or less at the end of the game. Richie Nelson, who actually ended up being my teammate in Cincinnati for like six years, he ended up having like a pick six in the game and took it back to the house and they ended up like selling the game. I think they won by like ten, but they didn't like beat us like that. But the one thing I learned from Coach Saban, from Coach Shula going back, spinning back to that was learning how to finish in the fourth quarter. Like, mm, with Coach yeah, Shula, yeah. we didn't know how to finish at all. Like, we we would play really good and set up for field goals. We didn't know how to finish. That was one thing that was, like, we really struggled with on offense was learning how to finish. And then Coach Saban came in and flipped the switch for us, and the rest is history. Yeah. Why do you feel like he's so – I'm making a little bit of assumption here based off what you said, but, like, you used the word, like, we all, like – kind of that second year is like when everybody really got bought in. And so like, to me, that's like, that becomes a coach's superpower. I think of it like if you're rafting, right? Like you want, in your case, 80, 90, a hundred people all rowing in the same direction. You don't want some people rowing left, some people rowing backwards. Um, That becomes like, you get faster and faster and faster, exponentially better and better and better. The more people start rowing in the same direction. Like, why do you like, or I guess maybe how, how or why, like, was he so successful as like, in terms of like getting you guys bought in, in turn, like, um, to go from where you were in his first year to his second year? Oh, man. Um, yeah, that's why I tell a lot of people, um, I don't tell a lot of people, I tell a few people this, that uh, Coach Saban wasn't Coach Saban. They, everybody knows today when he first got to Bama, he was the Coach Saban who just won one extra championship. And went to the NFL, didn't really have a lot of success in the NFL, but now right. he's back in college. And uh, my biggest thing was me knowing, me meeting him and knowing, getting to building a relationship was that he knew what it take, what it takes to be successful on every level. Even though he wasn't successful as a head coach, he was successful as an assistant coach while being in the NFL and just having his connections and knowing the success that he had at LSU really elevated everybody played in Alabama at the university at the time because they knew that we had a guy who's who knew how to win and knew what it took to win. And it was just, I mean, it was just like, it was just like he cut a light switch on for everybody. Yeah, like, yeah. Everybody, yeah. like everybody in the Tuscaloosa or anybody that was Alabama fans, just like he just reignited something that had been asleep for a while. Yeah, yeah, almost like Phil Jackson Jedi Knight ish. <laughs> I feel right, like right. like that that hey, is like hey. a superpower. Like I can crawl in your brain and start to just plant seeds, whether it's believing in yourself or believing in the team. Right. Do you and think? That, like, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was, I was gonna say is um, do you think that? I don't want to say okay with like the way that his first season went but do you think that was kind of part of the master plan is like hey it's going to take a year to like really lay this foundation to get everybody like all rowing in the same direction to where it's like now we've built the snowball effect now we've built this this ball rolling so fast that it's going to be impossible for for many people to ever stop us um i think it was um like Kosevin, like when he came in on seven, he didn't really he had like one year to get his guys in and those uh, guys yeah. weren't uh, you know, he had to get rid of the guys that weren't his guys. He had to let those not get rid of them, but let those guys play their last year out or last few years out at Bama then he would have the guys that he wanted in the positions where he wanted to play. And um I think that was one thing that made us successful. Like he he was really well at he did really well at recruiting early on, like getting uh, – we had some really good guys down there. You had myself, you know, I was the number one player in the country coming out of high school, so I had already committed to Alabama prior to Coach Saban getting down there. Then Why Bama? Like, Why Bama? Oh, uh, man, I wanted to build a tradition, man, you know, like a legacy that would last forever, man. Yeah. I, I, I always visioned the Alabama being a great, successful program, you know, and I just wanted to be one of those cornerstones to help build a program and elevate it and keep it up there. And I'm just happy and could glory be the guy that he gave me the ability to do those things that I did while I was down there. Yeah, yeah, that's super cool, super cool. All right, most fun, most fun thing about playing in the league. Um, 
was fun. Getting paid, basically. <laughs> and, you know, we didn't have NIL deals in college when we were there. You know, I wonder what my NIL deal would have been when I was in college. I was literally about to ask, how oh, crazy oh, do you think it would have been, sorry. like, with, with you guys? I think God, you know, I think it would have been bananas. I just think God allowed things to happen at certain times. I don't think I would have been mature enough, me, personally, to be getting a million dollars in college. Like a million dollars for me, a kid from Birmingham, Alabama. Like a million dollars in college. Like what? Yeah. I ain't gotta go to the league. I'm gonna stay in um, college forever. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But uh, but you know, I just but think everything. Do you, has to th go do you think that that's gonna happen? Because they're literally, I forget. I saw this post somebody on Twitter, and it was like a couple. Of, I don't even remember who it was, but it was like comparing their NIL deals to, and I don't remember. The, it was some big name like NFL players that were still on like minimum league contracts. And it was like these 18, 19 year olds are making like double three and four times like some of what are these bigger name right, like NFL? Right. Do you think that it's like it's going to keep people in playing college sports? I think so, especially if you're like, like, like you're a big name guy, like a five star player. Like that gives you like landing space right there. Like you got a long landing strip right there just because you're a five star player. People are going to. Want you to promote that brain if you're the right yeah. person for them, they're gonna push you, you know, promote them. And you know, that gives like, and then if you go to college and have success as a freshman and sophomore, and you want to stay two more years, go ahead, you know, yeah. get the money, then leave and go to college. If you like, it's all up to how you feel. But I know Caleb Williams, the kid out in um, at USC, out in USC, talking about he's gonna come back for his senior year. He's not gonna. I don't think. I think he's just full of crap. He's not gonna miss out on no thirty five million dollars, <laughs> <laughs> as opposed to ten million dollars. He's he's just shooting smoke up everybody's butt. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. That's funny. All right, most difficult. Let's go the opposite side. Most difficult or stressful or not fun, however you want to language it, about playing the league. Oh, man, probably get fined. What like, are some of the? I feel like there, I've or I've heard there's a lot of dumb fine rules. Like back in the day, they don't trip on stuff now. It could, used to be like your socks slim. Like if you had skin showing, like if you didn't pull your sock up right away, you would get fined. Um, like let's say you played with your socks rolled down to your ankles halfway through the first uh, half, through the first through the game, and you decide to pull them up in the second half, they still gonna send you a fine. And then it was like the ice shield. Like tenant advisors, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. They would be like a couple of thousand dollar fine. Um, just like crazy stuff. Like even if you like, let's say that you and a guy are blocking, the, you got your hand up high on a guy, you're blocking, and the running back come cut his leg underneath. The running back got to pay like a maybe like a twelve thousand dollar fine on that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Just because he high told him, but the running back didn't see I had my hand on the guy. At the time, so the league is still fine you for stuff like that. Yeah, even if the ref don't call it in the game, they'll come back and find you for, for, for just like just little stuff like that. Probably get yeah. fine. That's probably the worst. And probably the weight, like um, I had I deal with weight early on in my career, and probably the weight weight cost like every pound is like five hundred and ninety six dollars, something like that. So every pound you're overweight. They find you five hundred ninety six dollars. So if you five hundred pounds over, that's five hundred times five hundred. <laughs> I mean, uh, 50 pounds over. Yeah, you get what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, that's wild, wild. Most fun moment or joyful, uh, exciting, exciting moment. Probably my most memorable moment I can while playing in the league was probably my. Um, 2018 season, no, 17, was it, what was it, hmm, it was 2000, and, no, it was 2017 when, uh, no, dang, I can't remember what year, I think it was 2017, and uh, even the 2015 season, remember, was when we played the Seahawks, we ended up beat them at the last play of the game, they had us down by like 17 points, Going to the second half, and like, oh man, the Bengals are really lost. They wrapped it up, and then Mike News ended up in the field goal at the end of the game. And then I said, 2017, when I was rated uh, PFF 
um, highest rated lineman of the week and uh, against the Tennessee Titans. I had a heck of a game that year, that game, and um, that was really fun and exciting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A couple more. Um, describe draft day. Oh, man. <laughs> so I had two cell phones at the time. And uh, maybe like a week prior to, maybe two weeks prior to the draft, the uh, the Giants, not the Giants, the Lions at the time had the number one draft pick, and Martin Mayo, who was the um, GM at the time, he sent me a message saying if I get down to three fifteen, that they'll draft me. And um, I didn't make it down to three fifteen. I got down to three twenty five. Yeah. And um, they end up not drafting me, and um, so. They end up drafting Matthew Stafford, which is cool. Matthew Stafford, he's still in the NFL. He's doing had a tremendous career. He got him a championship with the Rams. Um, he played really well for Detroit. They just never had enough to get over the top. But um, like they drafted Matthew, and then um, number two was uh, what's that guy named the tackle Jason Smith. I think got drafted by the Rams. Okay, you know, yeah. He, uh, the defense end from Wake Forest. I can't remember his name right now. I'm drawing a blank. Um, I can't remember who number four. Number five was Mark Sanchez. And I was like, I went, then I'm like, looking at the phone, all these draft picks go by. I'm like, man, my supposed to be being got drafted. Like, what's going on? Yeah. So I look at the phone, make sure my phone worked. I called the other, called the phone that all the teams had number to make sure it was working. <laughs> then I saw, my, I saw the number pop up. I said, all right, the phone working, so I ain't tripping. So all those picks, lo and behold, go by, and then the numbers. And then we're going back to that, like, even in the combine, like, me and Marvin Lewis, we didn't see eye to eye. Like, we got to arguing. He was like, why are you not working out? I'm like, I feel I can get my best pro day at Bama. Like, I'm not here to pat these guys on the back and tell them good job. Like, I'm not here for that. I'm just here to do my interviews, and I'm doing my pro day at Bama. You know, um, just they – and then me and him got into it like a little confrontational. Then I had a talk with my agent. Like, hey, man, I don't know what's going on, but the Bengals are most definitely out of the equation. Like, like, <laughs> like they're not going to draft me. Like, me and the head coaches really got into it. Like, and he, and, um, long story short, then they end up bringing me in for like doing draft during the draft period before you get drafted. They take you in for interviews. So the team really likes you. Yeah, they bring you. For an interview, you stay the night. They take you to the best restaurant in town. They feed you the best food possible. They get the coaches to be around you just to check you out, see what type of player you are, to see if you're someone that can help this community and help this franchise to elevate it. So uh, most trips last one night. You fly in that day, midday. You're there all night. And then if they have some more medical stuff they want you to do, they'll take you to see that doctor just to make sure you met, check out medically. And then you go visit with the coaches. You go to dinner and then wake up the next morning you might come in for one more meeting with the online coach or something then you may fly out well long i had to stay in cincinnati for two nights so that was kind of weird like i stayed for one night then my agent called me said Cincinnati, i want to keep you for one more night and i was like one more night man i don't want to be in cincinnati for one more night bro they had me in the, the crappiest hotel in cincinnati like I love Cincinnati Bengals. They are like the my favorite organization. They gave me my first opportunity to be a like break generational um wealth to the family, bring it to right. the family. But they had me in the crabbiest hotel in downtown Cincinnati. It's not even there anymore. It's, it's called the Millennium Hotel, man. When I tell you, by <laughs> far one of the worst hotels in Cincinnati. I, did you did you nah nah you ain't never go by there, but it was the Millennium Hotel, right? So they had me there. I stayed there one night, and then I had to stay there another night. And then um, I went to dinner and breakfast with the old line coach every day. And um, he just was picking my brain's name, Paul Alexander. And um, we were just kicking in, and everything the vibing out. Like I said, I called my phone. It did work. So then I saw a five one three number pop up on the phone. And I asked my mom, who's a, she used to work for the post office, so she knows all the area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Five one three number. And she's like, uh, that's Cincinnati, Ohio. So I answered the phone. And he was like, hey, man, it's Marvin Lewis. Big fellow, we're going to draft you at number six. You remember what we talked about? Like, you got to come in with your head, head focused because we're going to depend on you early. And I was like, yes, sir, and I appreciate it. And then they drafted me uh, at the number six spot. So, yeah, that's how it happened. But I'm glad, glad that I didn't that's like – That's hilarious. You know what I'm saying? I could have – 
did been obnoxious in the meeting and ruined everything or had a bad visit. You know what well, I was going to say is like, uh, not saying you were immature, but it was like a huge moment of maturity right there too, especially right. that, that young and about to make a shit ton of money and being right. like, God right. damn, like these guys, like shit. Right, 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 right. <laughs> so how'd y'all's That's relationship turn out with, uh, with Marvin? Oh man, our relationship has been great. Actually, I talked to him about a week ago and, um, uh, he's out there working at Arizona state, um, been like the like a quality control to like type of, um make sure everything stays in order. Yeah, I guess type of thing for the defense. And, um, he's just been doing a great job, man. And he said he's by he's like um he's made a medal now. He's had a, a couple of procedures done. And he said my whole body's made a medal now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's been like pretty like pretty funny story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What well. One more question, and then, uh, like, kind of like my final. You're breaking one. up. Uh, you got me. Oh, yeah, I got you. I got okay. You. Um, any uh, as an athlete, one more question, and then we'll kind of like tie up, like, kind of the 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 wrap up question. Any regrets as an athlete, high school, college, pro, anything that you like? If you could go back, whether it be a maturity thing, like whatever it may be, like any regrets, like you wish you could maybe have gone a different path, different or different decision, different route? Um, My biggest thing, I wish I regret just making sure I picked the right people to hang around early in my career, you know, yeah. picking the right circle, making sure you hang around people that have the same aspects, that ambitions that you have, you know, to want to be great in every level and everything they do, just to thrive, drive, and have the ability to reach it, obtain it some type of way. Um, just make sure you just in, make sure you circle yourself around those type of people that have the same ambitions as you. Yeah, that's one yeah. thing that I learned early on in my career. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I, I love that. Mm -hmm. All right, last one. So, all right, what is your? It could be to athletes. I call it like, what's your core message to the world? And the best way to describe it is, is if you were asked um, today to stand inside a stadium full of like 90,000 people and you could only deliver like one message, you could only tell them one thing, what would that message? And as you kind of think about it, I'll tell like for me is, is like, and it's a big reason of like why I started the podcast and I want to have conversations with people because I believe that just like you have talked about today, it's like you created all these unique opportunities for yourself. I believe that like we are in a, in a very real sense, like the creators of our life. Like we go out, we make the decisions, we decide who we're going to surround ourselves with. And we enable build this, this identity and this person that allows us to succeed and excel in whatever ways that we actually desire in life. And I know people get tired of like listening to me talk about it. And so I believe like stories move people, right? And so to hear your story and to hear anybody else's story, I think that gives people a, a greater sense of certainty that they can go out and do things in their life that they can. I don't want to call give it hope because like, I think hope is a little bit like desperate, but I think it, it enables them to actually start pulling the trigger maybe in one more thing um, or maybe it's towards something that they, that they actually desire. And so that's kind of like my core message is like, you are the creator, whatever it is you want, like take a step back and really define it and create that person and go out and live it. And so for you is, is like, as you, as you've graduated from sports, so to speak, and like now you're in this, mentor and coaching role and being around you know young athletes and you've got a family and you know i know uh faith is pretty big in your life like what what what's that core message for you oh man my core message would be that uh basically i in it like i've always been like a hard farm believer like anything worth one is worth working working hard for so like like as an athlete, if you want to be successful as an athlete, you're gonna to have to bust your butt. You're gonna to have to do more than what the guy next to you is doing. If you really want to be that guy and be successful, you have to like push yourself to be the uh, best person that you could possibly be both on the field and off the field and also operate in integrity. What are you doing when people are not looking? Yeah. That's one thing that I also 
firm believer of like make sure you're the same person that you are when you're not around people that you are when you're by yourself like make sure you're the same person don't ever switch up and make sure you stay true to yourself stay true to your morals whatever they may be i hope they're all good morals just make sure that you stay firm on whatever you believe in and you know um i believe that faith with faith without works is dead meaning that I can have all the faith that everything's going to work out, but I know if I haven't been putting in the work to order to put myself in position to be successful, that my faith is like in vain. So I believe in that. So just like, just being a good person, like, like you don't have to be an asshole in order to be successful. That's one thing that I also believe too. Like it's okay to be an asshole a little bit, but you don't have to be an asshole to be successful. Right. Right. Yeah. I love that, man. I love it, man. Why well, I appreciate, uh, you taking the time to jump on with me and selfishly uh, appreciate like catching up. You know, I know it's been um, a little while since we got to like sit down and chat. Uh, six, seven, eight, nine. I don't even know how many years it's been since we like yeah, sat man, down and just shot the shit. Wife and stuff, you know, time flies. <laughs> and, like literally, I know it's like, damn, that is crazy. I have a kid. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Daddy right. <Ryan. laughs> How, how wild is that? So yeah, like selfishly, I know that's that's part of the reason too. Is is like I wanted you to to jump on just to sit down, catch up, hear. Um, like I said, I, I firmly believe is stories are what move people. I think that that's why we all like go to the movies and stuff like that because like we can get emotional in it, we can get motivated by it, we can be inspired by it, and so that's kind of like my goal with this. So I appreciate you, ma'am. I appreciate you, bro. All right. Until next time. Love you guys. Peace.